So, welcome to making a jetted pocket with me, Laura Robinson. Uh, what I've laid out here for you is I've laid out a, a sample piece of fabric with marks on it that denote where my pocket is going to actually be worked. So, here's the line for my pocket with some cross lines. Notice that the cross line in the front is very much on the straight of grain. The cross line on the back is slightly off grain because that corresponds to the fact that the pocket itself, the flap, sits in an off grain position when it's on the body. So a smaller man could tolerate a six inch pocket mouth opening and a larger man could tolerate the seven and a half. Here's my little pocket flap pattern. Pocket flaps are usually around two inches wide. Um, they can be bigger if you have a larger gentleman. Um, I wouldn't make them any smaller than two inches because then they just look a little bit odd. The straight of grain is on the front edge of the pocket, and the front edge of the pocket is rounded, as this one is, the front edge of the flap, and then the back edge is squared off. So that's your first step. So over here what I've done is I've cut out the flap in lining fabric and in face fabric. I've matched this um, herringbone pattern in my tweed. Uh, and what I've done here is chalked the pattern out and then I have taped the outside leading edge around the front, across the bottom, and up the side. One of the nicest things about it is that um, the glue does not transfer through the fusible web, so you can not use a press cloth. It provides lengthwise stability because of those little lines in it, but it provides some stretch on the cross, so it gives us the ability to round the chest in tailoring, but to keep the stabilization of the lengthwise grain. So I use it as a fusible stay tape on a lot of different tailoring uh, applications. So that is what I put around this edge. Um, I don't cross the tape over here. I've clipped it a few times and let it kind of fold over itself to make the curve. But I don't lay over. You can see I've stopped this piece here and then put this piece here. And then here's my pocket lining. Um, here's two pieces of pocketing. Um, I don't make a pattern piece for anything other than this. Um, it's one of those places where tailors don't take a lot of time to make a precise pattern. Uh, it's just, we need some squares of pocketing, here's our hand, cut around them, we have pocket bags. I like to call it the one that hangs when you put your hand in the pocket on the top side of your hand and then the one that hangs on the bottom side of your hand. That seems to be very helpful when I teach people how to do this. You can just put your ruler down and mark, mark here, mark one more and then square off your edges and come up with this piece of fabric that you need. And on this piece of fabric with this line down the middle, you are simply going to measure off your width of your pocket mouth. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to cross mark and I'm going to measure off my six and a half here. And I'm not going to worry that I'm not quite in the center of this piece. I'm just going to go for it because it's fine. Okay. This is going to end up being two pieces when we get done. But right now we're going to stitch it onto the body of the garment as one piece. Um, it is on the bias because these welts are very small. Um, and oftentimes it's easier just to cut a bias of this. When you don't use a bias strip for your welts, or when you can't get away with it, I should say, is if you're doing a pinstripe, you will want the welt fabric to run on, the pinstripe should be running with the welt to contrast with the fact that pinstripes will be running up and down on the body of the coat. So that will feature the pinstripe because a stripe will end up right on the welt. That's one time. Another time is if you're doing a plaid and the designer is insistent that your welt completely match the plaid fabric. Is I'm going to put a small strip of the Taylor's Elite over where my pocket mouth is going to be worked. When you bag out any kind of a flap, like a pocket flap like this, 
Um, Taylor's do something that is called favoring uh, by old school people, which means that my chalk line is right here. And what I'm going to do is I want a little bit more of this fabric to roll over the edge and roll the seam of this pocket flap to the inside because I don't want to see lining on the edge of my pocket flap. So I'm going to compensate by pinning outside of my line on the face fabric and then pinning inside my line on the lining fabric. The tailor I worked with when I was learning how to tailor called it would say um, favor an eighth to an eighth or a sixteenth to a sixteenth and that would mean that I would go a sixteenth outside the line on the face fabric and a sixteenth inside the line on uh, the, the uh, lining fabric. So you start and you do what I just did. You start by doing these two corners and then you come down and you find middle. So I'm going to pin here and here just for now, just to hold that in. And I'm going to kind of find middle over here. Put that there. And then I'm going to find middle of the bottom here. And then I'm going to work myself to the corner and work myself around that curve. Uh, and then what I'm going to do is simply go to this sewing machine and stitch this. Um, just a regular stitch. When you get to the point here at the corner, actually taking a stitch across the corner uh, is actually produces a better point than trying to pivot at the corner. Um, you're stitching a very thick fabric to a very thin fabric. So just knowing that if you make a little room there in the corner for some of that thickness to go into, it's going to produce a better corner. After I've done this, you're going to see you're going to get this little bit of excess in the in the face fabric, a little bit less in the back fabric, and you're going to stitch on your pin line. That becomes your new stitch line, and we'll come down. We'll back stitch where the start where the the actual piece starts here, not out here in the seam allowance. We'll come down. We'll take one stitch across. We'll go around. We'll come back up. We'll back stitch here, and then we'll go off. Uh, then what I do with this piece is I will trim it down, I will grate it, uh, and then trim it down, uh, pressing it open over a ham. I have a ham that has a rounded edge and then a pointed edge. So I will be able to press this whole seam open, and then I will turn it, press it, and I will press it from the wrong side, the lining side first, kind of pulling that seam around and, and pressing that seam around that edge. The last thing I will do to ensure that that kind of stays where I want it is I will do a basting stitch just around this edge, kind of holding everything together to make it nice and smooth. Uh, and then I will lay my pattern, I will lay my pattern back on top of my piece and I will put a basting stitch across the top. And that basting stitch I can do on the machine. I've made my flap up and I based it around the edges and you can see that little roll of the seam line to the inside edge all the way around the edge and then I have basted that down and then I've machine basted it across the top. I've remarked fused a piece of fabric to this of uh, Taylor's Elite for reinforcement and I've gone back and marked my lines again. Uh, so now we're actually ready to start to work the pocket mouth. So one thing I'm going to do before I start working my pocket mouth is just do a quick check that my pocket mouth, my pocket will still fit nicely in my pocket mouth. And sure enough, while I was stitching, it shrunk up just about a sixteenth of an inch. So I'm going to go ahead and remark my pocket mouth right now, just that last little bit, so that I know that that's where I need to stop stitching now so that my pocket mouth won't be too big for my pocket flap. Now we're going to concentrate on making this little guy and this little guy be together. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to pin through the corners of my pocket mouth opening 
on the body of my coat so I can see them from the other side. I'm going to pin the center line here of my bias piece. It's not super important that it stays completely true to the line, uh, but it is important to kind of line them up for now. So now that I've lined them up and I've pinned them, I'm going to do something totally paradox, which is I'm going to pin the outside edges down and I'm going to unpin that line. I've pinned it on. I'm going to flip it. And now I'm going to go to the machine and I'm going to stitch from here down this line to this line and stop. I will not back stitch in these two places. This is a place where using a, a knot to tie off is very important. If you backstitch here, it makes a little lump, and the very edge of your jet will have a little lumpy bit in it. All of these points, two straight lines of stitching parallel to each other, starting and stopping on the cross marks. This is the most important part of making this pocket successful. As you can see, I've stitched these two parallel lines. I've started and stopped on my lines, and I've tied them off with square knots. So now I'm going to slash this apart. The first thing I'm going to do is slash this bias strip, just the bias strip, right down the middle. You want to make a nice straight cut. Now that I've done that, I'm going to come back and I am going to slash my body of my coat between these two dots, which are about three eighths of an inch in from my edges. I'm going to slash once again right down the middle of this part and I'm going to feel behind me, kind of put my hand back here and spread this out so that I don't nick that welt fabric, that little bias strip that I've just uh, stitched, cut in half. Stop about three-eighths in from each edge. little dot there that I put there to stop where I wanted to stop. Now I'm going to cut to each corner. Two, not through. That's important. I just want to cut the body fabric. I don't want to cut the welt. So uh, what I have here is what we just saw, which is my welt opening up now. My, pot, my jets are opening up, so I have a mouth now. Uh, and I'm on the wrong side. I'm going to press this now. Uh, and forevermore over a curved surface. The reason you do this is because oftentimes by the time you put in the pocket, uh, you have stitched the darts and shaping into the fronts of the coat and you've already got a rounded area that you're stitching this hip pocket into. So from now and forevermore as you work, continue to press on the rounded surface and wool, which is a lovely fabric, will continue to want to be round once it is cooled and dried uh, in that position. I'm going to work on the bottom one first. And the first thing I'm going to do is turn it to the inside. I want to make sure that my little triangles that I cut just now are flat. I'm going to press this open. I'm going to start out here in the excess allowance of my bias piece, pressing that under, getting a head start at it. So now I've pressed this little seam open. Now I'm going to take the edge of my bias strip and I'm going to roll it over the seam allowance. So here's the edge of my seam allowance. I'm just going to let it roll over that and form my jet.
And the reason I start out here is the welt will continue in its nice even width past where I'm stitching it. So now I'm going to do the top one. Same exact technique. So there they are, they're in. Now what we're going to do is lock these two triangles off by stitching them on the machine. And to do that, we're going to turn back, poke through. So now that little triangle is lying back here and we're going to stitch on the machine across this edge and back stitch, just kind of go down and back just to lock that off. And that will lock that corner off and make a nice, beautiful little corner on your welt. All right, so I have now stitched these little edges off. And what you can see is here I've stitched them. So you can see the little just stitched off. And I've stitched this one off, giving it a quick little press. And now I have basically my pocket welt opening is ready for the pocket bags and the flap. So the first thing we're going to do is address the bottom or the one that you would feel on the back side of your hand when you put your hand in the pocket. So I'm going to grab a piece of pocketing and I'm going to flip this over. We're going to lay our pocketing on so that it's straight of grains line up with the straight of grain of the body of your coat. I flip under the top edge so that it's about a half an inch from the edge of the pocket mouth. Kind of give it a little crease and then I take the bottom edge and fold it up out of the way, flip it that way so that that little creased edge is there. I'm going to pin out here in the edges. And up here so it doesn't flip back down and get in the way. And I've got that all pinned down. Now, come back to the front and ditch stitch in the ditch of your jet. And as you ditch stitch, you you're not going to back stitch. You're going to pull that through and tie off, but you're going to ditch stitch this on. So this is what it looks like on the back now. Okay. So I'm just going to trim, and anytime I trim, I usually trim things separately. I don't trim multiple pieces of fabric at the same time. I think you make unfortunate disasters in trimming when you trim more than one piece at the same time. So now I can pull that down over that stitching and give that a nice press. So first of all, I just laid that piece, second piece of pocketing, I just laid it in over the other piece of pocketing. I can have those edges even at the bottom and that's fine. And once again, I'm just going to pin this down out of the way of the machine so that it stays down, but it's not, the pins aren't in the way when I put it into the machine bed. Now I'm going to flip it over I'm going to take my trusty pocket flap and I'm going to insert my pocket flap now into the mouth opening and I just want to just get that basting stitch right at the edge of the fold of this jet. The jet is not too large for the flap nor is the flap too, too large for the jet. It I'm going to pull back the body edge of the coat and reveal that little bit of seam allowance of where we worked our jet. And I am going to go to the machine and I am going to stitch right on 
this edge of the seam allowance right next to my previous stitching through all the layers. Now that it's stitched in, and feel free in this place, you can go ahead and back stitch if you want. Uh, it's perfectly fine up in here, nobody's going to see it. And actually, back stitch is a nice, secure way to hold all this together. You can see that I stitch right against that edge, that second set of stitching, and it's stitched all the way through. Um, so now I'm going to make a pocket bag. Uh, so what I'm going to do is fold back here along that edge and fold back here along that edge, pin them together. You want the pocket to be deep enough that someone can put their hand in about to just where their thumb attaches to their body, unless you've been told that something quite large and special has to go in this pocket. If it's very heavy, I will actually support the back edge of the pocket with a strip of pocketing that attaches to the back edges of these pieces and goes up into the arm's eye. Men's pocket bags are rounded on the edges. They're not squares. And the front edge of the pocket is lower than the back edge so that if you have a coin or a token or some round object it will want to roll to the front of the pocket and collect in the front edge of the pocket. Also, the nice part about this is um, rounded edges don't collect lint. I'm going to come in and grade off this strip of fabric. I will trim out my little welts these little folds and make them as flat as I can. And I'll trim this one and that one. I like to come into the fold and actually clip into the fold and trim them off that way. And then this will be done. And the last little bit you do after you've stitched your pocket bag, um, you will come back, stick your pocket flap inside your bag, and then you will stitch this shut so that as you work on the rest of the coat, this does not have a tendency to sag down. Um, a couple of words about some marking uh, that I use, some marking utensils. Uh, big fan of the practical designer still for things like this where I really need to see. Although I would never mark in red on something that wasn't as thick as this wonderful wool tweed that I'm working on. Uh, so I do use colored pencils. Um, most of the time I use Taylor's chalk, so that's what this is. Uh, it's It comes in kind of this triangular shape. And I try to mark and then turn and mark and then turn to kind of constant, constantly keep a nice sharp edge. Uh, and I have a sharpener for this that actually I bought at Joann's that's this little purple thing that you just run it in and it makes the edge sharp again. Keeping a nice sharp straight edge with chalk is a skill building exercise that you need to kind of practice so that you keep your edges and you keep your line nice and thin and straight. Um, but that's what this is. Chalk goes away very fast. Uh, so it's a lovely thing to use kind of as a temporary but Sometimes it's too temporary. And then this is something that I picked up um, recently that I'm actually is my new favorite toy tool. This is Rabbit Disappearing Chalk. It has a little rabbit on it. And it's very brittle. So using a lot of pressure on it will cause it to snap in half. And if you drop it on the floor, forget it. It's just going to shatter all over the place. But it's great because it makes a line, a nice line that you can see, and you can press it and it goes away. And unlike friction marker, it does not come back with cold. Um, 
quality supplies I have been using Bias Bespoke. I get all my canvases there now. Um, I get all of, I get just about everything there. Um, they're a little more expensive, but they have a really nice variety and a lot, a lot of nice varieties of canvas weights.